mentioned that they don't really care. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so I went ahead and sat in my office and I'm just trying to think of what is wrong with my staff. Do I need a whole new staff? What do I do? I, I, I turn around and I see this book on my shelf. It's a book that I got a few months earlier from a conference. And uh, I had read a little bit of it, like three chapters, and that's my normal reading pattern. <laughs> After three chapters, I get bored and I get something different. That sounds more exciting. So I pretty much know about a lot of things, but I know nothing about those subjects. I just didn't know how to introduce them. And, uh, and so I do joke around. I know you look really serious. Like, I'm, being, I'm not. Okay? I, I read up to chapter four. Um, and so I, uh, I looked at this book. It's called Leadership and Self-Deception. Wow, they really need this book. <laughs> <laughs> so I started reading it again and going through it and started talking about the leader and the responsibility of the leader and how we as leaders deceive ourselves in so many ways. And we are blinded. We have these, these blinders inside of us that we refuse to admit that they're there. Not only are we self-deceived, but we are resistant to the idea that we're self-deceived. So even if someone, my wife, or someone else brings it up to me, I'm like, uh-uh. And my wife, I'll tell you about her a little bit. She's Italian, from New Jersey, from the coast. So she has no shyness about bringing those things up to me. But I still refuse to believe it. And, uh, and I started understanding something. That the problem was right here. Because I started realizing something that's true about people everywhere and about leadership, and it's true about uh, organizations. And my nonprofit was no different. That I had gone to a place where I was looking at my staff as objects to accomplish my goals so that I could look good, so that I, my organization could be successful. And all those people who thought my organization was going to fail because it was dying, I could prove to them, you see, I saved it. I'm awesome. I'm so great. And my staff was blocking my goal. They're supposed to help me. I'm paying them. Well, it's a nonprofit, so it's not my money, but still, I'm paying them. And I was really convicted of that, of wow, it's me. I'm the problem. And so I found training on a weekend that you go. Friday night and all day Saturday, you come home Saturday night, and I told them about it. And I knew they were going to be excited about it. Hey, guys. And they're all in their 20s at that time. And, and these were kids in my youth group who grew up, went to college, came back, and started working for me. So you know what that's like. They're like my children. Like, I knew all their ex-boyfriend situations. And, and we were close, and we got to the place where they didn't want to see me. How did we get to that point? How do we get there? By me as a leader looking out for me. And not seeing their needs and not looking at their goals, but looking at my goals and trying to manipulate them for my success. How could you get there with your own children? Let me tell you about my family. Uh, this is uh, my wife Jennifer, I just told you about 29 years married. She's just one woman. Yeah. And look how happy she is that she married me. Uh, uh, she's very honest. She, very, a lot of integrity in that woman. And uh, she's just helped me learn that. Uh, then I have my two adopted children, uh, which is cool because they look exactly like me. <laughs> my redhead freckled uh, baby from Kansas. I was trying to get a kid from Mexico, and this is what I ended up with. <laughs> If I look curly mexicanita, it would be great. Papi, papi! It's daddy, daddy! And you know what? I'm really proud. She placed out the Spanish one. They didn't have to go to one class. And last week, she went to the grocery with mom, and she said, Mom, I want my own salsa. Because daddy said, I want my own can. So she bought her own salsa. I'm like, yes! Yes! We made it! She 
She's internally Mexican. <laughs> and this is my son Micah. He's uh, 11, just turned out. Yesterday was his birthday. Uh, and at our party yesterday, his birth father was there. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, we, from the very beginning, decide to adopt not just our kids, but their birth parents. Yeah. And so uh, next week, uh, Saturday, we're going to be at his birth mom's house, and we're going to celebrate it there. Uh, birth parents are not together, but they're young. And, um, and so we decided to love on them and bring them the support that they needed uh, because they were giving us the greatest gifts they could ever give us. And, and so that's my family, and they taught me a lot, and, and my redhead especially. She just tells me how it is. So um, <laughs> with family, it's the same thing that happens a lot of times in our organizations. There's a lot of similarity. And one of those similarities is about systems. Family, you know about family systems. Most of you have studied family systems. But in the same way, things happen even in our organizations. And I like to look at it this way. This is me confronting my wife. <laughs> Honey, your shoes, or you left your shoes out. Oh, that was not good. Because she remembers every single time that I left my shoes out. Ah, she's not mean. She's a great person, but I'm so scared of her. Um, <laughs> and, and one of the things that happens sometimes is that we push and we, we do certain situations that we don't realize the domino effect it's going to have on us or on others around us. And that's what happened with my staff. I thought I was doing something good. I thought I was doing it for God. I was doing it for the community. I was doing it to help people. And it's really about me. And it was that transformation from me to others that helped me grow, learn, develop relationships, and build the collaborative relationships that I really wanted within the community. I learned how to do that through my family, and I learned that through mistakes. Today, what I want to share with you is how to think about systems. And we're going to use family, we're going to use your work um, and in the community. Um, and we're going to start there at the bigger level, but we're going to hone down to you as a person and the system that you are and how you affect those systems around you. And then we're going to go back out to your system and how you can affect it in a positive way. Is that okay? Does that fulfill your, your expectations of coming to this seminar today? Is somebody expecting something really different? Because I like to change those expectations. My philosophy is lower expectations and you always win. <laughs> All right. So let's think about systems. Um, this is very basic systems thinking about an iceberg. You know it. Uh, some of you maybe have read the, the analogy about the penguins in the book, uh, Tip of the Iceberg. If, if you see it somewhere, grab it. It's a great little novel about systems. And there's a lot of different books called Tip of the Iceberg, so make sure you get the right one on systems thinking. But it talks about the glacier or the iceberg, and the iceberg is the... On top of the surface is what you see, and we all know the principle about icebergs that underneath there's a lot more mass than what you can actually see. Well, this is true in organizations, and this is actually true in people too. And in an organization or a system, we think about uh, the events, the programs that we do, but underneath the surface, you see the mental models and the structures. How we deal with other people, our values, our vision, our mission, all those things are underneath. And a lot of times what we do when we see a problem in a relationship or within our own organization, we'll look at just the program and we'll think our program's not effective because the pro something wrong with the program. But sometimes we really have to go look deeper inside our organization and not just what we do, but how we do it and how we see others as maybe a, an issue. Maybe the pro program's okay. Or maybe how you're doing it or, what you're, or how you're thinking about it is wrong. So... Let, let me uh, share with you, uh, when it comes down to changing systems, we can get very overwhelmed and you think, uh, say, you think, okay, we're going to really work on this neighborhood. Uh, there's your rural community, so I'll lower my numbers, not from the city. So there's a thousand families in this neighborhood. Okay, I'll go lower. There's 500 families in this neighborhood. How are we going to change 500 families? How are we going to have real impact where you can actually see it and people really benefit from this? It's too many. And like all of you, in our own or in my own organization, we have some of these people, but uh, we usually see them a lot in the community that we have uh, a lot of OMDBs. Do you have a lot of those? What is that? 
You don't know what OMED is? Over my dead body kind of people. <laughs> you have some of those? What's that? We call them cussing and grimaces. <laughs> I'm not repeating that. <laughs> that sounds like a really uh, Texas way of saying it. <laughs> so what, what, when I, I was talking to uh, the president of a denomination in Florida, a, a big denomination, they have 200 churches, and he looked at me and said, well, I don't know I don't know how to help all these people. And so we worked on this. And I said, who are these people? Who are your make it happen and help it happen people? And that's where you start. So we, we came out with about 20%. And we said, that's a great way to start. And a lot of people have written about systems and this is that in order to build momentum, you can't start over here on this side. You've got to start on this side with those people who are able to make it happen. And you use them as examples and build energy towards momentum in a community. Does that make sense? Um, and it doesn't always work out that perfectly. Uh, but it, it's what I call the 20% principle. Where, who are the 20% of the people that we're working with that really get it and really want to move forward and help? Not that you ignore everybody else, but you definitely want to spend time and energy on those that 20% um, to move forward. So, a lot of the principles that I'm going to speak about today, you can find them in three books uh, by the Arbinger Institute. Uh, and the Arbinger Institute helps companies all over the, the world, even helps countries have peace with one another, resolving conflict. And, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about that because conflict costs you so much for your organization. It costs you so much in your family. And then your clients, the conflicts that they have, it costs them a lot. A lot of time, a lot of energy, where you don't always have time to deal with the real issues because you're dealing with conflict. Am I the only one or is that true also for you? Yes. And so for us, it's when we work in the public schools, we help parents and kids resolve conflict. And we taught them skills on how to do that. So that they can now start talking about things of development, long-term issues and goals that they're having. And so for, for some of these families uh, who were having a lot of conflict, we help them resolve them. And we started thinking about their future. And then we helped them go to that financial literacy program. And within a few years, they were able to get out of debt and then they were able to buy a house, which was a dream for them that they saw 10, 15 years away, it became a reality in three to four years. And, and that's why you and I do what we do, right? We're trying to help people be able to accomplish their goals and be able to be healthy, and especially children. So these are really three books that I would recommend. Um, the first two, Anatomy and Peace and Leadership and Self-Deception, are, are the ones that are more of an analogous story, very easy reading. Uh, our Mindset is their newest one, and I really like the language of that one, too. Uh, so I recommend any of them. So let's start with change. How do you change communities? How do you change people? How do you change your organization? Um, if we look at this model here, and it's very simple. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Should I use the mic? Is this better for you? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. I, I should have done that from the beginning. I'm sorry. I was yelling too much <laughs> for a good reason. Um, because you guys made me really angry. <laughs> hey, it's the rowdy group next door. Yeah. And you know what? Um, even though the executive director is here, I'm still going to do this. They, some of those people there didn't come to my first session. And they missed this session. You're here. We need to make them jealous. So for just three seconds, we're going to clap and yell really loud. Ready? One, two, three. Some of you are way overboard. <laughs> you needed to get that out of you, right? It feels good to do that. Well, maybe I'll ask you to do it at the very end, too. <laughs> Shamelessly. All right. So, say, uh, let's say that right now, uh, you, these are your results, and they are following your behaviors. Okay? You're doing these certain programs, and there we're getting these results from what we're doing, and it comes, those behaviors come from a mindset. Okay? The mindset is the way that we think about systems and things and, and why we do what we do. For example, when I went to a school and I said, uh, we also want to work with your parents, and they would say no, we would say thank you. No, we're not working with you. 
That was one of our values. That was our mindset. Our mindset is if we cannot get the head of the household, we are not doing systemic change like we want to make. Not that they're not, some kids, you can make an immense amount of change without their parents, right? We, not that we don't, we believe that, that you can't, but we like to have significant abounding change in this community. So we said, if you allow us to work with parents, then we'll work with you. And, and that, was, that was our mindset. Um, so if say you, you say, well, we don't like what's happening now, we wanna see improvement in our programs. What, here are results, they're now there, I wanna move here. Um, how do you get there? How do you get to better results? Anybody? What do you have to do? Change. Change what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, most people would say that, and I think that's a common approach. You change your behaviors. So we're not reaching this group, so we're going to go and knock on someone's doors and go this way, right? You change behaviors, um, and that's what you do. But one other thing that's true also, what happens is when we just change behaviors and not focus on mindset, is that a lot of times, if the mindset's stuck somewhere, you know what I'm going to say, right? Our behavior goes back. By working to change not only behaviors, but also underlying mindsets that enforce and drives them is what really brings you to this goal. So behaviors do have to change. I'm not saying they don't, but so does the mindset. And the mindset actually precedes those behaviors. So what we tell organizations and people is if you want to change, see better results from what you're doing, you got to change the mindsets and that's going to drive behaviors to bring you results. Very logical, right? This makes a lot of sense, but we don't do it very much. Um, and so I, I want to explain to you how relationships influence others. How re your relationship, and even things you don't say, not your behavior, but even what you think, how you see other people, affects your relationships and therefore your effectiveness. It really does. People sometimes think it's all about outward behavior. I'm going to be nice, I'm going to shake hands, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to make a great presentation, and they're going to say, great, we want to collaborate with you, or great, we want to fund you. But a lot of things happen underneath the surface. And, and if we don't pay attention to what's going on underneath the surface at a deeper level, we might miss it. Have you noticed that certain organizations get all the grants? Some of you are, not us. There could be things underneath going on, and that's what I want to address. But um, one of the things that happens in all, all interactions is that in order to build trust, you have to build a relationship. Very basic, right? That's what it means. To, to have a relationship means there's some trust there. And so you have to have behaviors that allow you to have more trust. And that includes listening and learning, teaching and communicating. But you know what can erode trust is correction. And when something goes wrong, we usually go there. You have a staff member who did this and now they're coming back and you're going to sit down with them and share with them how you can correct the wrong they did. You might correct their behavior, but you might not correct their mindset. And that's why you have to think holistically about the person you're talking to and going further down, and I'm gonna explain this more in a little bit, but uh, behavior and, and uh, mindset really do affect your success. And here, um, the, the thing that, that you have to learn about this pyramid is that um, you always work, start working from the bottom up, not from the top down. So if I, if I just, I always use my redhead as an example of conflict, because we have a lot of that. <laughs> You know, when she does something wrong and I go and correct her, how effective do you think that works with this 14 year old? Uh, 14? 14. <laughs> when I have conflict with my 14, I sometimes miss it and my wife has to remind me, not just that she's 14, but that I need to work on teaching and communicating with her before something happens. So before we gave her the phone, we had a contract. And we had specifically consequences for her breaking that contract. Uh, and did she break the contract? Of course. But it was written. And she knew it. And she admitted certain things, so she went ahead and deleted it. Um, girls, what's some of those, uh, the, the app that you, it erases as soon as you post real quick? Snapchat. Snapchat. 
We had a rule that at, at, at age 12, she could not have Snapchat. And she went ahead and downloaded it anyways. And we had a contract. And that contract was able to help him point back. And, and we, we taught her why, but she still messed up. And kids do that, right? They want to do their own thing. But one of the things that you notice sometimes, with not just kids, anybody, is that sometimes, even staff members, you try to teach and they won't listen. Because something else is broken. And usually it's because we haven't spent enough time to listen and learn from them. They have a lot to say. They have a lot of stuff they're thinking. Even the quiet ones have a lot of stuff that's going on. And if, if something's going wrong here, then you go down to this level of listening and learning and trying to work on that on yourself. But if that doesn't work, then you go down to the next level of building a relationship. And this is where a lot of times we fail. Build a relationship with people. An article just came out. Um, on, uh, I'm a big basketball fan. I'm a big San Antonio Spur fan. I always have been. I moved to Dallas, and I'm still a Spur fan. And I will be till I die. Popovich, coach Greg Popovich, has a whole article on his dinners that he has with his team. And it talks about the detail he goes into to develop the, the right menu and the wine list and the seating of the tables. And he's, a, he's the first one at the restaurant. And he makes sure everything's perfect. Then he, the players come in, the other coaches come in, the executives come in, and they don't talk about basketball. They just eat and enjoy four or five course meals and the best wines possible. And he pays for it himself with his own pocket. And he does this throughout the year with his team because he has learned it's really important with his team for him to correct them, for him to teach them, for them to be able to understand he has spent a lot of time building that trust. And building trust with people is key. It's hard work. You don't just say, okay, trust me, collaborate with me, work with me on this project. You have to spend time with people and with other partners so that they can trust you and then you can be able uh, to to work together. Um, and, uh, but the problem comes in is, is this part right here, our mindset, uh, our mindset. And just like I explained to you a second ago about my own staff, um, I had an inward mindset. And there, there's two, you have an inward towards yourself, or an outward mindset, okay? An inward mindset is this. An inward mindset believes that other people don't matter like I do. I matter just a little bit more. So, so their goals and their objectives and their challenges really don't matter to me very much. Okay? And therefore, um, what really matters is me, and so they're, they're this to me. Oh, by the way, did anybody notice this chair when you walked in? Anybody say hello to the chair? Why not? You don't care about the chair? Because it's an object. Right? And sometimes people feel like this to us. Maybe it's like a tool that I'll use it to get to where I need to get. To change a light bulb. How many high does it? No. no <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes people have treated you like this. They used you. How does that feel? How does it feel for your boss to use you? Sometimes we use the chair, and sometimes we don't even notice it. It's relevant. And you know how that feels. Or sometimes they're like some of the kids in our programs that we just move out of the way because we have a goal to accomplish. And they feel like they're a bother. And, and when we see people like an object, uh, it can be any of those things. And so my objectives and behaviors are my focus, and they are used like I use my staff for me, right? So they can be vehicles, they can be obstacles, or they can be relevancies to us that we ignore. So what happens is that even if you're, you can be very nice and do that. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to outwardly tell somebody you're an object to me. It just happens by the, sometimes without even notice. You can even say something nice, nice shoes, and not really mean it. And for us guys, we're like, I don't care. <laughs> But the truth is, is that we can be objectifying people, even in good behavior. 
Because what you, what's going on inside of you, how you see others, is what really matters. And people can tell. People can tell. And so sometimes you'll hear someone say, I was so nice to them and they were so mean back. Maybe you were seeing them as an object, not a person. Maybe they noticed that you were being self-centered. Maybe they noticed that something about you just wasn't right. And when we talk about collaboration and collaborating with other organizations, that's something that's really key. As I said earlier today, if the other organization feels that you're there to use them, or the Hawk Foundation feels like you're there just to take their money, or the volunteers are feeling like they're just there because you usually need these office things done, but they're not part of really something bigger and something greater than that, uh, they're going to feel that way. So you see how that erodes trust? The opposite is the outward mindset. And this is the kind of mindset that says other people are important too. Now, people like you that are, that are health professionals tend to do this to the extreme where it's unhealthy. You tend to say their needs and objectives matter more than mine. And some of us are willing to sacrifice ourselves and think about other people so much so that we don't care about us. That's not what I'm talking about. And I said this in the, in the hour earlier, that it's really important that you do self-care, that you advocate for yourself. It's very healthy to advocate for yourself. I know you know you're good at advocating for everybody else, but you, you also need to advocate for you to take time off, to be able to get rest, to be able to be with your family, to do whatever you need to do to take care of, of you. And let me tell you, I am so impressed with the kind of work that you guys do. I think it's fabulous. In the early hour, I had a lady who said, oh, I'm just a CASA volunteer. I'm like, oh, what? I'm only a CASA volunteer? You're awesome. Right. Yes. I fostered three kids. I needed our CASA so, you know, workers so much. And, and it's critical that you are there long term, so please take care of yourself. Don't hear what I'm saying to the extreme, okay? I just want to say that. Um, just so that you don't go far off, because some of you tend to do that. And, 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 and by the way, some of you are saying, but I can't. I'm so busy. I've got all this other stuff to do. Uh, you're making choices. Okay? I know you have all these reasons why, and you have all these altruistic reasons why you should do this for others, not yourself. But you really have to do it to be sustainable, to last a long time. Okay? So your marriage is important. The way your kids, your own health, the way you eat, the way all those things are critical for you. Amen? Amen. All right. Have people agree with me. That's good. So this is what this means. Not that their needs are more important, but that they're equally important. So how do you do that? Well, when you talk to others and have a relationship and collaborate with others, you think about their needs too. So when, when I was with a school district... And, and I work with them, and, and you heard my story earlier. Um, we, we took care of the kids, and then we took care of the teachers, too. We saw the teachers, even though they weren't our direct clients, they were taking care of our clients from Monday through Friday. Teachers are my heroes. After I was in that classroom and saw what they do, <laughs> right? And, and so they, they, they are not just teachers, they're moms, and they're counselors, and they're coaches, and they do all kinds of stuff with these kids. I'm talking about lower income communities where I see this a lot. And, and so we started taking care of these teachers too. And, and what, we, what we saw is that the, the administrators noticed that and they, they said, that's their job too. I'm taking care of some of their job for them. In my little space, whatever I can do, I was doing that. And, and so um, the teacher saw us in a different light because of that. We're not just coming in and interrupting their classroom. We're coming in and taking care of their kids and them. And, and then open up trust. So it's, it's seeing all those around you that you work with and that you live with and their needs and objectives. And it's not easy to do. But this is what opens up opportunities and doors in relationship and trust. I don't care how good you, you are as a salesperson. I don't care if you're able to sell your program really great. If you're seeing people like this, doors will close. Doors will close. Let me show you a little video that I think you'll relate to. <laughs> you're 
you seen this before? Yes. Excuse me. I know you didn't get anyone to catch you, but you just slammed your door into my car. The least you can do is say you're sorry, lady. I don't have to take that tone. It's not like I'm hurting your resale value. Oh. I'm sorry. See? Like that. <laughs> this is what the arbiter considers collusion. We collude with each other to act bad. To give the other person an excuse to strike back, to justify what they're doing and justify what we're doing. Now, who here was wrong? Who thought they were wrong? How long is that going to go? <laughs> a long time. So how did, when we see other people as objects, we're inviting them to see us as objects. And then something happens and it triggers this right here. It triggers collusion. And I see it within organizations that are supposed to be working together that only do it for the money or don't even want to work together anymore, or, or different relationships with donors, with boards, with staff. Stuff is sometimes the worst place this happens. And so what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about how we get into these kind of collusion relationships and how to get out of it so that you will be free to be able to do the work that you were called to do. Again, our organizations and we as individuals spend a lot of energy and a lot of time trying to deal with these kind of things. And it's not just nonprofits. It's uh, for-profit organizations, too, that do it. So... I need a couple of volunteers. Can I have a couple of volunteers up, up here? I won't make you, you won't get hurt right now. <laughs> you have two? Yes, I need two. Come up here. <laughs> Brave volunteer. Look at her. You don't do anything, just sit there. Okay? This is where sometimes our relationships are at. And let me tell you something. This can help you, not just you and your organization, it can help your clients, okay, with issues they're having. A lot of times we spend a lot more time with our clients solving this than actually helping them move forward. So they're mad at each other. They're in a relationship of collusion. They're all both thinking of themselves. How do we solve this? What needs to happen? 
Someone needs to turn around, right? Does it always happen where both turn around at the same time? No. Go ahead and turn your chair and you stay where you're at. It's all, right? No. Yeah. Which name? Sarah. Sarah. Was, would, they, would Sarah do solve the issue? No. Yeah. What else can Sarah do? I shouldn't have asked that question. You guys have all these creative ideas. The answer is supposed to be no. All you can do in a relationship is invite other people back to the relationship. She can apologize. But if this person refuses to turn around, it doesn't matter what she says. Communicating greatly and doing all the I messages, if this person refuses. And sometimes that's where it ends, unfortunately. As much as it is within you, have peace with everyone, is what an old writer wrote. And she can do all she can to have peace. That's right. The tracing has to, has to turn around and she refuses, she refuses. But this is what she has done for tracing. She's given her the invitation to turn. She has now, now it's a possible thing that this could be solved, this conflict. But without her turning, it won't at all, right? One person has to turn and invite the other person to a relationship. Will you turn? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, go ahead and turn. <laughs> okay. This now gives an opportunity. Oh, that's so sweet of both of you. <laughs> This gives them an opportunity now to, to solve the issue. And what it is, is, is understanding the dignity that each person has, the value that they have. And, and a lot of times when we get in conflict, it's a lot about us and how we felt, and now we feel like we have to protect. Okay? So what happens is usually when we get in this kind of conflict, somebody or both parties misbehave in some way, right? They said something too sharp, they you know mentioned something they shouldn't have, they made an assumption they shouldn't have, and, and what happens is that this gives them an opportunity to say, I'm wrong. Okay, I was wrong. I should not have done that. And that's really where reconciliation, conflict resolution starts. By, by admitting what we have done, most people want to wait till the other person starts first, right? Somebody has to start. Now, what happened before when you guys had your chairs turned around, how, how do they feel? They feel pretty good about themselves. They feel bad about themselves. Usually not this. It's a mixture. When when she says something back to her, how does she feel? She feels good too. You know what? When she tells me something bad about me. It makes me feel better because I now justify what I said earlier. And it's going to justify my next move. She deserves it. Look what she just said. <laughs> Boom! There's a deeper thing going on in conflict. There is a higher need for justification to justify the bad things we did, how we misbehave, than there is to have peace. In other words, we'd rather be right than have reconciliation. <coughs> like, who's asking that question? <laughs> Tell her she can learn more here. Than on the phone. So, so one of the things to understand is that what's pulling us to hold on to the anger and what's pulling us to hold on uh, to that hurt is self-justification. Instead of saying, I shouldn't have done this or that. Let me, thank you ladies, you all done great. Tracy, Sarah, I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. No clapping for you. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is, let me give you a simple illustration. And dads, you, you understand this one. There's only four of us here. But still, <laughs> baby's crying, middle of the night, 3 a.m. We are walking by that and why visit? What do you do? Do you fake sleep? <laughs> or you get up and grab the baby? 
<laughs> Wake up. Well, uh, this is uh, young Oscar when he was, you know, not very knowledgeable about this stuff. Besides, you just wait <laughs> till she woke up. And you know what happened? Her snoring got louder. She didn't wake up. So I'm like, are you serious? What kind of mother are you? Ladies, I said that was earlier, Oscar. Not earlier, Oscar. Don't throw anything in. And you know what else I did? I started justifying myself. I started feeling guilty. And guilt is the key to relationships. When guilt comes in, you do two things. You either apologize or you justify. So how did I justify myself? I'm such a good father. I have to get up early in the morning before she does. I have to go to work. And I started, you know, trying to make up stuff, great stuff I've done. <laughs> because in order to justify myself, I have to blow myself up. And I have to bring her down. You know, three weeks ago, she slept through this. And then, you know, how she let her, my daughter fall that day. And I make stuff up in my head. You actually make things up in your head when you're trying to justify yourselves. You lie to yourself. We deceive ourselves. And like I said earlier, it's not just a self-deception that's bad. It's the resistance to the truth that we're self-deceived. We resist it. And so, guess what happens? She all of a sudden wakes up and she goes and feeds the baby, comes back, goes right to bed. And I'm still wide awake. Because I'm justifying myself. And I'm angry. I'm angry at her. What did she do wrong? She didn't do anything wrong. But I already worked up all this conflict in my heart. So in the morning, we wake up, and she's like, hey, you want to make the bed together? I'm like, sure, fine. She's like, what's wrong? Oh, well, nothing. I'm tired. I didn't get much sleep. I lied. Because I was too ashamed to admit the truth. So I go to work. I come home. I'm using her car. I know that it's low on gas. What do you do? I'm mad at her. She can get her own gas. <laughs> so the conflict multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. And that's just a home example of what happens all the time at work. Right? A little thing and a little thing. We justify ourselves and we blame because we rather, we rather uh, be justified. Can you mind like getting up for a second? Here's an example. What do you do? Someone does this. What would you normally do? Okay, I know I'm, I'm really bigger and stronger and bodybuilder, but what would you normally do? I would better. <laughs> the guy that was here earlier, and there, what he did because he's a big guy, he put him up. Okay. And many of us walk around like this. We go to work and we already like this ready for anybody who's about to say anything to us, to attack. A client comes in for help and we're ready to attack. And there's a difference. But what if I come to you like to stand up again? I'm sorry, this is good Okay, that's enough. That's too much love there. Right? There's a huge difference on, on our mindset and how we approach people. Approach them like this invites them and that's the power you have you have power to invite people to do this or do this you have power for your parents and the kids and all the people you work with when they leave your office when they leave your program are they going to leave like this or are they going to leave like this and in a consistent daily basis people all around it depends who it is oh for this client it's this for that client i'm ready for this Partner, it's this. And, and we all do it. And it's not about bringing you guilt and making you feel bad. It's about you being self-aware and reflecting back on what kind of influence I'm having based on how I approach, what kind of mindset I have. And can you see how different that is? The distinction between for him to approach me quickly versus backing away? What if everybody on our staff was like this. 
Is that possible? They come and work like this? That they deal with their clients like this? It is possible. And it makes a huge difference in how you deal with people and how they respond to you. So, let me tell you a quick example that's personal with my daughter, my redhead that I always talk bad about. She's my favorite. Wait, I don't have favorites, sorry. Come home and the wife says, you're a daughter. <laughs> Messy room, she's disrespectful, she talked back to me, blah, you know the story, right? So what do I do? When I see that, what do I do? I blame her. I go to her room, and instead of greeting her and saying, hi, honey, I'm home, how are you, baby? Guess what I do? I just scream. You get here, right here, you clean up this room. I cannot believe it's this dirty. What does she see? Did I just invite her to hug me and greet me and respect me? What did I invite her to do? Yes. So what does she say to me? Fine, Dad. How come you and Mom are always wanting a room, clean room, and I have a lot of stuff going on, and she just yells back. What do I see? Mom was right. She's an angry little child. So what do I I'm sorry, what do I see? I see an angry little child. So what do I do? I want this room cleaned up within five minutes. Now I'm making demands. What does she see? An angry father who doesn't listen to her, who's just demanding, and now it's starting to get me. So what does she do? You and mom, blah, blah, blah. And as I'm walking out of the room, she slams the door and almost hits me. Oh. <laughs> Level four. <laughs> Turn around. I open the door. Round five. <laughs> you see how this happens in the parking lot and how it happens in relationships at home, and this is exactly what happens within our own staffs, with our own people that we work with. Right? I was happy she yelled at me because then I could yell back. That's not good. What's the answer? How do I solve this? What's that? Have my arm, how do you how do I extend my arm? Hey, how are you doing? How was your day? And then it, then you go into what's up with the room? <laughs> hey, how you doing? What's up with the room? <laughs> so talking cool. No, I, I, I think you're, you're onto something is that you stop the cycle. You stop being part of it. You, you, you don't engage at that level. I'm the adult, right? I should have not even started it. I, I, I basically became an ally for my wife's anger. And what I should have done has been an ally for both. Ally for peace. Ally for reconciliation. But I'm too afraid of my Italian wife, I guess. <laughs> and I want to be loyal. But what, what, what happens in these situations, the only way to win this is to stop it, and like you said, to sit down and actually have a conversation. Right? Tug of war. Who wins? In a relationship, no one. Right? The only way to win a tug of war is to both parties let go. Or when they're pulling let go and watch them fall. But anyways, that's just fine. <laughs> and, and so... This is how we, we need to look at, at these major conflicts that we get into sometimes, is that they're never going to stop and they're going to create more conflict and more problems. And so the only way is to stop and apologize, turn the chair around, do whatever it takes. So that's what it's called here, getting out of the box, getting out of that place where you can't seem to think anything other than blame. Improve your mindset. What improving your mindset does, it really builds a relationship um, and with others and who have influence, and then it, it helps everything else in the relationship go better. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to ask for questions or comments, examples, where you've seen this. I don't mind waiting. He's got the water. Well, you don't always know. I think you need to talk to the time to kind of try to figure out where that other person is coming from. You don't know what happened in their day before they got to you. And 
yelled at you and you need to be a little more tolerant of where where they came from. What happened to them. I love that. I'm going to talk more about that in a second, but that is a big part of the solution. It's a, a sense of understanding. Has anybody ever seen this on a, a, a conflict like that in, in your staff, in your group? If they're here with you, don't point them out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have a question. There are times when you're attempting to build trust in maybe someone that you are responsible for as a leader, and yet maybe there are perceptions or, you know, past difficulties that they bring within the relationship that you're trying to establish in order to help them meet both their goals and our organization goals. And so, I don't know if you can speak to, to maybe, you know, that sort of dilemma where you're that's a really good question for somebody who is, you know, for a leader in an organization. How do you deal with, with person, a person who has issues, uh, baggage, uh, and, and, and yet at the same time you want to you wanna have them be effective in the organization, right? But also help them as, as a person. Um, and, and that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about how to practically use this in an organization uh, that helps people both stay accountable, but at the same time, do it in a way that brings dignity and hopefully builds a relationship, because that's what you want, right? You want them to be healthy, but at the same time, we need them to get stuff done. Does that, I, would that answer your question, if I could yeah. give you some of that? Um, that's going to cost you a little extra. <laughs> so w one of the, the, the things that people mis misunderstand is that in order to see someone as a person, you have to be nice. I'm not saying you have to be nice. You have to see him as a person. It's a difference. Again, you can be nice and still cause separation. And so sometimes you have to do some really hard things, the right things to do, and do it in a way that brings them dignity and care, and they feel like you understand. And so I fired people before who I saw as an object. They were an obstacle to our organization, and I paid for it. But I also have fired people who, you know, I needed to do it, but I did it in a way that, that, that brought them a sense of care for me. You know, I put myself in their shoes, and I thought about ways I could help them and make it better, even though they're going to lose their job. And, and so there, there's, there's ways to do the hard things, but do, do it in a way that really brings people to a place of peace. That doesn't mean they're going to like it. It doesn't mean that they're going to love you right away, but it does mean that at least you know in your own heart that you did all you could to, to bring resolution to that. So how do you keep people accountable in a way that still sees them as a person? Do I have to be mean to, for my staff to accomplish what we call, we have to, and the answer is no, you don't have to be mean, you don't have to be rude, you don't have to be hard all the time. Um, and so one of the things that we did in, in my staff is we rewrote our manual when we hired people. And we outline this very clearly about our expectations for ourselves and for them. And that they're going to be part of our organization, that they're going to start seeing other people as people, and this is what we mean by that. So you're not just an employee here. You're part of the family. And so we're therefore going to do these things. And when there's a conflict, our expectation is that we would deal with it together. And we would really hear you out. <coughs> and your grievances, we would address them correctly. Um, and, and so we did several things like that. Second thing we did is that when we do evaluations of each person on our staff, we made sure that people were not just responsible just for their own things. For example, um, let me show you a slide and skip over a few of these. Um, so um, every staff member had to include in their plans for the, each quarter how are they going to help the director, their supervisor, accomplish his goals, her goals? They're going to see their clients' goals. They're going to see their peers, other people on staff, and they're going to see their direct reports. And I'm going to evaluate them not just on their specific job, but how they're collaborating, how they are helping everyone else around them. And I would ask each one, 
how is Mary helping you accomplish your goals? And that's, when I talked to Mary, I said, this is what I heard from everybody else. You are or you're not. Because we have a lot of people who are about, they're silo thinking about my job description. And yes, they have to accomplish that. But, they, but in order for them to be team, they have to be accountable to be a team. But what we do is the opposite. We say, you know, that you accomplish all your goals. And, you, and again, organizational goals is, is how we do that. So in, in a person who is not performing very well, um, and who's having trouble, of course, uh, it's to sit down one-on-one -on -one and going over what areas of weaknesses uh, and what areas they, you know, they usually know. They usually know where they're not performing well and, and to work with them through that. But if it comes to a point um, where they're, they're not coming through, then we do say, you got this much time to correct or we're, we're going to need to um, send you to work for the Hawk Foundation. So <laughs> just trying to keep you guys awake. All right. Does that make sense on that? With, with a, a person, um, it, it, first thing, it's a team thing, and someone still has to be held accountable. You know? And, and if, if there's a lot of issues, of course, then we try to bring all the help we can. Uh, some people, you just can't help enough. You know? and, and they have a lot, a lot of baggage that they need to get professional or, or they need to coach. Uh, we have worked before with organizations that I've said, um, you know, get them a coach. They need a coach to help them develop their plans and accomplish and execute. Some people just don't know how to execute. And so um, I find it my responsibility to help people get there. But there's a certain place where you have to say, it doesn't seem like this is a fit for you. 90% of the time, they, they would agree. They already know that. So I'm going to go back real quick to um, solutions. Three solutions to all conflict and all, all relationships when you're struggling is you, you got to see them as, as, a, as a person. You look at their needs and their objectives and you make them part of yours. Two is you adjust your efforts. What can I do to make things go right for them? And then the last one is measure. And this is, of course, you guys know a lot about measuring. You measure the impact that you're having on that relationship. And I hope that you do some self-reflection at least once a quarter, maybe where you count, calendar out and then you, you say, how am I doing in developing relationships with this person, this person, this person, or this organization outside, or these donors that I need to be meeting with, whatever your role is. Um, and so those, those are the three real simple steps that you need to take to help others around you. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna skip this for a second because of time. I want you right now to think of someone you think needs to change in some way. So much easier to think about somebody else's problems. <laughs> but I want you to identify the level of pyramid at which you have been weakest at okay. in that pyramid. Is it building the relationship with them? Is it listening to them? Or is it teaching them? And then I want you to brainstorm things that you could do um, at any of these levels to make it better. Again, always go down deeper. The deeper you go, the better. And so sometimes it takes just spending time with that person uh, to sit down and talk to them. I already talked a little bit about that. And then after that, you're gonna pair up with someone else. It could be someone you don't know. And, and you're gonna share that just for a minute. Um, and then hopefully you might be able to get some ideas from sharing on, on the things you're actually gonna do. So I, I want you to get to this place to where you actually have one or two things you're gonna do when you go home, okay? We have about 10, 15 minutes to do this, and, and then I'll bring us back together and we're gonna close. I'd like to ask you a question. Thank you for talking a lot, and I interrupted your great discussions. I apologize, not really. Um, so what did you learn? What did you learn about, and, and you're thinking about this person and starting to put together a plan. How'd that feel? What were you thinking? What was difficult, what was easy? Them without first working on ourselves and our minds. <laughs> <laughs> something you respect or appreciate about the person so that you can start working on how you. Can you be less excited about that? <laughs> <laughs> She's not happy about it because she really doesn't like I can tell. <laughs> Oh, no.
So, I'd rather you be honest and sad than dishonest and happy, for sure. I actually do teach a class, and I've Proceed teaching the class with a very monotone voice, so I'm going to have to put inflection in this. So I didn't know it coming to the <laughs> seminar, I was going to have to put inflection in my voice, so let me change it. <laughs> <laughs> what we talked about was the need. <laughs> you, you know what's so difficult at work uh, when you have a person like that is that the other people that you start talking about and and you know, being able to vent your frustration, you gotta vent, right? Yeah. yeah. They become part of your justification. They agree with you. And it gives you stronger sense against that person. And you do that for each other. They borrow your attitude. They borrow your well like you to borrow your wife's anger and frustration, your daughter. You took that on, you personified it and you so I, so I didn't finish my story. I went downstairs, and you know what I said? You're right. And she felt so good about that. And we were colluding together against my daughter. We got right here. Yeah, I understand that, right? And, and then she went to my, my son and said to her brother, could you hear Dad yelling? They're so mean. And she's like, yes, I know. So we will go out and seek allies to, so we can feel better about ourselves. You got to be really careful about that at work. Yeah. And, and I just shared with someone recently that try to find another place to vent about other people at work. Yeah. Yeah. Not at work. Yeah, yes. Find someone outside. And I know some of you are saying, like, my husband's tired of me venting. <laughs> <laughs> but find someone who really listens. That was good. Yeah, you like that? <laughs> who really cares and listens? Yeah. Not your husband. <laughs> Who else? What else did you learn? What else were you thinking about? Yes. We were talking to each other about troublesome employees, conflict resolution, and things like that. And and you know, recognizing that sometimes it is time to just say, "Bye, Felicia." That's her name. <laughs> yes. Uh, to protect, you know, identities. But yeah, no, seriously, there is a time where they're just not a good fit. And if they, if they come in bowed up every single day, and they have the attitude, and no matter how much coaching you do, and positive affirmations, and sticky notes, and gold stars, and hey, good job, love it, doesn't matter. Because they, when they look in the mirror, they see negativity, and they see somebody unworthy. And if they don't see that they're worthy, they can't even take a compliment. They can't take the good job, and the out of boys, and the out of girls, and all of that. That's not something that I can change. That's not something anybody can change. It's got to be the person looking back in the mirror. And sometimes it is. It's just if they become toxic to the entire organization, to their team, all of that, you know, you've got to look out for the organization the best thing. But you're doing them a favor, too. Oh, absolutely. And there, so there was one time with this one employee who shot the name. Um, and there was a conflict between her and another staff member. And I was on a conference call. And I got emails from both of them at the same time. So, ding, ding. I'm on a conference call. Going, okay, I'll deal with this they in need a few minutes. Right? They wanted an ally. Well, they didn't expect me to be Switzerland. <laughs> so I came in and I literally sat here and I had them facing each other. And I sat here and the toxic employee was furious because I wouldn't take her side. I said, I'm taking the side of the organization. Very good. And you know, and I made sure that they both felt heard and et cetera. They could repeat back. They did the mirror listening, all of that stuff. But it just didn't matter. Yeah, and, and the thing about toxic people is that they're contagious. Yes. And you got to watch it; that it doesn't get to you, because you can end up with the same attitude uh, because of what that person does. The other thing is true too. A person of peace is contagious. And we can't fix certain people, and that's not what we're supposed to do anyways. But we can help other people who are wanting to be at a place of work that is peaceful, that is helping people, and that is not so self-focused. So I want to encourage you with that. Thank you. Um, you. You can be contagious, but certain people just won't move. we got to move on. Okay. What else? I'll 
to share something. Um, what I thought was interesting about the pyramid is even though we were told to think about someone else, the levels of the pyramid are really not about that person at all. It's about your approach, what you're going to, your action steps. It has nothing to do with the person at all because mine was actually my husband because he's a procrastinator. So every year his goal is not to procrastinate. And I was like, well, I know I have a relationship, but obviously I'm not listening. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with him. That That is really me. And yes. I have to take that action, not really him. So I thought that was interesting. Um, to see in that pyramid. It's not that we're procrastinating. <laughs> <laughs> we just have to have all the information before we make a decision. Uh, that comes so close to home. That's good, that's good. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right, is that we cannot look at the other person's, uh, what they need to do, because it, it has to do a lot with us. It really does. Um, and so please don't call my wife about procrastination. <laughs> my motto used to be anything worth doing, no, there's two of them. Anything that you can do today, you can put off till tomorrow. Yeah. And the other one is anything worth doing right, it's worth doing half right. <laughs> she liked those. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. All right, good. We only have a couple minutes left. Any Anybody else that has something that was kind of interesting for you? Yes? I had not really been on discussion, but I had a boss one time who was that negative person. I had a boss one time who was that negative person that couldn't, I mean, he couldn't make anything. He did an evaluation of me one time, and I worked with the co-op students, and instead of saying I had a good a good rapport with my employers. He said he hadn't heard any complaints from my employers oh. about <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, when it's your boss, you know, you have to figure out a way to work with it where you don't make yourself miserable all day, every day, and, and you know, you have to somehow deal with that, and we did, but it was, it was very discouraging. Anyone else? Yes, go ahead. I think for us, it was really along the same lines of what everyone else was saying, but kind of self having. Yeah, I think um, for us, it was really similar to everyone else, and what they're saying, where a lot of it is your personal responsibility and taking, you know, time to go through things and making sure that you are working to build relationships, but also accepting that not everybody is going to be of the same heart you are, and to recognize that and be responsible for people. Yeah, here you are. Go ahead. So, so there's there's a couple of questions I like to ask uh, when we're in a conflict or relationships. Is how how am I responsible? Because we always think about them, right? How are they responsible? How am I responsible? Right. right. That's question number one, and then you take care of that. The second question is how can I help things go right? How can I help things go right? Why? Because now you're a part of the solution. You're contributing to the issue, and and that's where you want to be. You're collaborative. Um, and so make sure you get to the second question. Uh, so if you're a supervisor and you have a couple people having issues in your staff, then you do look at yourself, how, how have I allowed this to occur? How have I contributed to it? And then how can I help things go right? Um, and, and when people feel like you're trying to help, it really changes a lot of their attitude. So, so that's a real helpful thing. Um, and I'm end with, um, with uh, my continued help, I, I really love what you do, and I love the, the things that you're working on. If I can assist you some way in the future, whether you, your staff or a group you're working with in your area, love to have more of this to be taught. Uh, love to come help and talk about systems and, and relationships like this conflict resolution. Or you need a coach or facilitator of this, I'd love to help. So that's my information. Um, and I'm going to end with this. Now, I came to this uh, Hawk Foundation knowing very little about what you do. And I did, I've done my research and I've learned a lot. Um, I am super, super impressed with the kind of work this organization does and what you are doing on the front lines. The people and, and your clients that you're working with deeply need you. And that's why this work I'm talking about is so important. 
that, that you work and self-reflect and, and try to become the person of peace. They need it. Your clients need peace. And, and uh, so if you become an ambassador of that where you're working, you're going to have an amazing life. Thank you. It's been a privilege. It's been an honor. I really appreciate it.